Welcome to The Cutting Room Floor, a weekly podcast of the teaching team at High Point Church, where we talk about sermons, sermon prep, and things we wish we could say on Sunday morning. All right, welcome to The Cutting Room Floor. This is episode 21. And uh, it is nice to be with you guys again. We've been going here for the past few weeks. We've had our summer schedules, vacations, uh, but we are all around the table again. As usual, we have the teaching team of High Point Church. This is Pastor Mike Willis. Hello. Good to be back with you. Pastor Derek Blue. Glad to be back. (laughs) (laughs) I'm still on vacation. That's that's where you come in. (laughs) And Pastor Jack Hillegas. Hey, how you doing? Uh, We had finished up Beyond Red and Blue uh, for this year, and that has gone over so well. We are not going to have a chance to cover that last episode for immigration, but we really do encourage you to check out our YouTube channel to see that full service and, and get that message from Pastor Mike. It was really, really well received and very well done. We are well into our new series, Romans 8, The Power of the Gospel. And today we're going to cover both um, Sermon 1 and Sermon 2, which are also available on our YouTube and we are um, going to provide you with two study guides as well, uh, which you'll find at highpointlw.com. And again, if you guys have questions, feel free to send me a nick at highpointlw, any questions you may have, and we would love to follow up with you there. So we are going to start right off. Pastor Mike, you started us off in this series, and uh, you started what, from verse 1? Where did you go through? Verse 1 through 4. And uh, maybe give us a, a, a brief overview and maybe read through those first few uh, verses, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I started by um, just referencing a quote from Dr. John Oswald that the Bible takes us on several journeys, outward journeys, places like from Ur to Canaan, from Egypt to the Promised Land, from Jerusalem to Rome. And then there's these inward journeys that we have to take to from sinner to saint, uh, from stranger to heir, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the power of light. And, and so we were. I was just using that to kind of get us set for taking a journey over these next four weeks through Romans 8, um, which is really one of the most powerful chapters in Scripture, in my opinion. And we just really talked about, you know, I, I had to set up the whole series, first of all, to kind of give us an overview of where we were going, that we were going to be talking about a new position, a new person, a new promise, and then a new perspective. And so Those are each of the four topics. So I'll just read this from Romans 8, the first four verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, those things that I said. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, And I was just talking about, you know, it had been um, my 25th year of of ministry, the anniversary had passed, and I was talking about when I started in that, I went on my own journey and left Florida, family, security, moved up to Michigan. And part of the thing that I remember going into Michigan was somebody had spray painted on a bridge the words, trust Jesus. And I remember that that was uh, really personal for me. We were having to do that as we took this huge step of faith. And and I just think that um, when you start to do that, when you trust Jesus, you never know where he's going to take you, what role you're going to play, what he's going to ask you to do, or what he's going to ask you to say. And so I was kind of leading up with that. And, and really um, use that to transition into Paul's story where he had his own example of that, where he's traveling down the road and met Jesus and, and then moves into this powerful um, leader in the church, uh, you know, and is writing the Roman church. He's never visited there at this point, yeah. but he wants to. And it's such an influential letter for Christians nowadays where he talked about that I'm not ashamed of the, of the gospel right. because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And he just starts drilling this home, and you have to really work through it. You know, the challenge was um, we've only got so much time, and you really, I wanted to spend so much time on the first seven chapters of Romans because there's so much there. But I have to kind of touch on that lightly and then get to Romans 8. And so it was all about moving from seven where he's talking about the sinful nature of the flesh that kind of, uh, is at war against us and the spirit nature that's trying to bring about this new life in us. And because of Jesus, because he rescued us from being the wretched men and women that we are, uh-huh. as Paul talked about, 
uh, he gives us this new position in Christ. And that's really where the whole thrust of the sermon came from. Yeah, this when I was listening to it, I, one thing that came across for me was you had mentioned how Paul describes himself as a servant. And um, mm-hmm. what was so interesting when you read through those first few uh, verses in Romans 8, you start realizing like Paul was so well versed and immersed in the law and his upbringing. No question. You got to imagine like he's now coming to terms with the fact that it's still powerless to make right. a change in who we are. Mm-hmm. And he's coming to terms with that as well as being willing to let go of everything he has known and being willing to become a servant again to God instead of just a follower of the law, which it just seems different for him. I would imagine that would be a really hard transition for him to make, but then even more so to try to tell other people, yeah, I spent my whole life learning this law, but I, now I realize it's powerless and I need something more than that. So that's such a amazing realization and an incredible way to start. And one one reason why I think seven and eight, Romans seven and eight are such a powerful thing is it's 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 the power of the gospel. That's what's so amazing yeah, about yeah, it. But yeah. Pastor Jack, you talked to us um, throughout this year. We go into these series during the summer where we're getting immersed more into scripture. Mm-hmm. What about um, chapter eight for Romans for you and, and things that might preached on on uh, the first Sunday. Yeah, it, we try every summer to um, either go deeper into a specific doctrinal issue. We've done uh, summers where we went through the Apostles' Creed together. We've done summers where we went through the I am statements of the ref or the um, sola uh, statements of the Reformation, and, or we try and do a deep dive into some passage of Scripture and. You would love to go all the way through the book of Romans. It is Paul's most profound, well thought out, maybe uh, well thought out, I guess, um, presentation of his gospel, yeah, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you want to deal with the whole book, you may as well commend yourself to about five years worth of preaching. So we decided <laughs> maybe the way to get into this is try and pick the high point. And it seemed like Romans chapter 8 is the hinge point of the uh, of the whole letter. Yeah. And um, where, but the key text of it all and where we get the title is from his uh, statement in chapter one, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness, righteousness of God revealed from uh, faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And... Um, so that's that's the key um, to the whole to the whole letter, and we've tried to keep that in mind as we look in Romans chapter eight, is where Paul um, has explained the problem with the law, right? And until you and the problem with our flesh, and, and 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 until you understand the problem with the law and the problem with the flesh, you cannot appreciate the power of the gospel. Yeah, and that's what he spent seven chapters talking about. So I appreciate the struggle that both Pastor Mike and Pastor Derek dealt with in that you're jumping into the middle of something. And so they really did (laughs) have to take a good deal of time helping everyone understand where Paul arrives at the end of the seventh chapter saying, oh, wretched man that I am. That's the problem with the law and the problem with um, trusting in the law or in your lineage, which is what he spent the first. uh, You got to get there before you are truly truly understanding the power of the gospel. And uh, you had said something about how miraculous it is that a man like Paul, who had spent his whole life leaning on and trusting in his righteousness or righteousness that comes about by the law to come to a point where he understands that it's only through faith. Well, that's part of the power of the gospel. Yeah, exactly. It's a miraculous thing. Right. Um, people don't change their minds like that. Yeah. Um, it did it, the mind of a man is changed like that when it's been invaded by the gospel. Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, you're right. It it did take to to fully appreciate Romans chapter eight and what Paul was saying. One, as it's already been stated, you kind of had to reflect on who the author was and right. how uh, he even said at one point, I believe it's in the book of Philippians, that he counted all of it dung. Mm-hmm. Yeah. his whole pedigree yeah. he was just like man like Philippians and, and, yeah. and, and that was you know I'm just imagining what his counterparts was, were thinking you know this is Saul of Tarsus right so is, is this what you're saying so one that demonstrates that there's certainly power in Jesus 
yeah. because it 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 would only take him to make a, a such a, a a radical change in the life of somebody like Saul, and you know, and 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 the the law revealed the weakness that was in the flesh. Uh, the law was perfect. The law was, I mean. Moses received it by revelation. It was certainly mm-hmm. God's word right. to man and yeah. God meant it. Yeah. Uh, but the challenge, as we said, it was that the flesh, the flesh is a mess. And the law revealed how wicked and wretched that we were. But the gospel revealed how good the Savior is. Yeah. And that's that opened the door you know, to this to this whole conversation. And the one thing I love about this this book this letter um, was that it was just like Paul was comforting. You know, he was writing. It was just comfort to people who was perhaps struggling one with their flesh, right. but then two struggling with this whole idea, man, I, this, this stuff has been perhaps drilled in a lot of people's head is that you obey the law, right. you know, you, you obey it, you obey it. And now here this person is having to explain and give context to what that looks like in light of the gospel. And I think the switch too from condemnation to conviction, like that whole idea that uh, you're no longer condemned. This is something that you said that really, um, really hit home for me in your message was you spoke to someone saying there is no longer condemnation. God doesn't condemn you. Uh, so any, but so you may need to stop condemning yourself. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. that was an important thing to tell people. It's we're, we're quick to take that place and say, I'm not good enough or we'll convince ourselves that we're so we're so messed up that there's no fixing it. Correct. And we allow, mm-hmm. again, we just put ourselves right back under the law of, uh, you know, perfection that we, we, we are not capable of satisfying only Christ can satisfy that. And he has, but we, we quickly remove ourselves out of that position of grace that Christ gives us. And we start measure, trying to measure ourselves up to a perfection that we can't do on, on our own. I thought that was a really important part of your message. We can do one of two things. We can can look at the fact that I'm so wretched and I can I can never get out of that state or, um, you know, and, and so therefore there's nothing I can do. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Getting to the place where I realize that right. gets me to the place where the gospel can really transform me. Yeah. And I can realize, wait a minute, I, I don't have to be like that anymore. Who I used to be isn't who doesn't have to be who I continue to be. And that's the point that I was trying to make to people because I really did feel like that was for some people that needed to hear that specifically, that he tells us that we're not condemned anymore. So stop doing that to yourself right. and allowing the devil to do that to you. So uh, you had said here in your handout, so a second point we learned was that we must rely on a new strength. And uh, this is where God showed his power by sending his son, by thrusting him into the situation. And the question you attached to that was, have you ever had a time where you uh, kick the can instead of relying on Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> okay, so a couple of weeks ago, and I told this story that um, I had just walked into our laundry room and one of the appliances in there was leaking in a way that it shouldn't. And uh, we had a, basically a swimming pool in oh, our yeah. laundry room floor. And that's never what you want to have happen. And uh, so I'm trying to clean that up and I'm picking up towels and I'm slinging water everywhere and and my wife's looking at me like I'm crazy. And then I pick up, there's a trash can in there that has, you know, empty laundry bottles and dryer lint, things that you throw away when, you know, when you empty the dryer lint, because our right. kids don't, nice. my wife and I do. <laughs> right. um, and so I decide that that's a perfect time to empty that trash can um, in the middle of this swimming pool area. And I take it out to the front porch. It's raining outside. And I'm so mad at what's going on. I punt that trash can out into the front that, yard. Yeah. I've never seen that side of you ever. <laughs> it, it takes a lot to get right. me there but well, i got there that there. night <laughs> and so w- when i did these laundry bottles and everything just goes scattering all over the front the front lawn and then i pick up each of the laundry bottles and punt them <laughs> separately um <laughs> and, and one of them i shanked so i picked it up and punted it again and i think i sent that baby about 40 yards yeah. and i look back at my family and they're all laughing at me and, and one of our kids even took a picture of all the stuff on the front lawn. I wish mm-hmm. I'd have known that ahead of oh time. My gosh. I would have shown it. But my point was, at that point, I realized this is out of my hands. It's it's beyond my control, my capacity to fix it. I had to call in an expert. Yeah. And so we did. 
and got the appliance taken care of and all that. But the new strength part is just, that's where I was going with this because it's all about um, that, you know, my flesh is weak and I'm wretched and I can't do these things on my own. I can't save myself from this place. I've got to call on someone who's, who's an expert, who's more powerful than me to do that. And that's Jesus doing his work in me through the Holy Spirit. That's what I was trying to get people to understand and that we all need that work of the Spirit in us. Paul seems to, you know, the, the chapter starts off with that great line, there is therefore now no condemnation, which is a judgment term. It's a legal term. And he ends the chapter by saying we are more than conquerors. So we've right. moved from yeah. con- being condemned to being conquerors. Exactly. And when he gets to the end of the chapter with all these great rhetorical questions, who shall lay anything at the feet against God's, who bring any charge against God's elect? He even asks the question again, who condemns us? None. Christ Jesus has died for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, but he does a wonderful job, of course, being the Apostle Paul of showing that sin is defeated in our lives in two ways. It's objectively defeated in the fact that Christ sent his son to be a sin offering for us. Yeah. And in his death on the cross pronounced condemnation on sin. We're mm-hmm. not condemned, right. but in verse 3 right. he says Christ did condemn sin in the flesh. So sin objectively, we are the, the power that sin has on us was objectively conquered in the cross of Christ. And after he establishes that, then he starts talking about how then sin is also conquered in its day-to-day ability to control us because of the person of the Holy Spirit. So those two ways that that we're empowered, delivered and empowered by Christ to conquer sin. Something that you highlighted in your message that, um, Pastor Jack, you sent some like a, a, re- a review or a summary of chapter seven, or really an expository paper on it, which was really nice to have leading into this series. Um, but that you had said sin is not just a bad habit that you can reform. Mm. Mm. It's got to right. be done away with. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, <laughs> Pastor Derek, you say this often, you, you say, uh, it's it's hard to get rid of a, de- a devil that you like. Yeah. yeah, you said that on Sunday. It was I, a great line. That was a great line, and yeah. it's helpful too because when you are so in love with the the habits that you've formed, or even if you're reforming one, you can just go right back to another habit. Like exactly. it's you can't just live your life in a habitual situational style of life, or you're you're never going to change. Mm. But it's the new person that you're becoming because of the Holy Spirit. That's the change. The objective um, death of sin is now possible because of Jesus Christ. Mm. And then the the placement of the Holy Spirit, because Christ has left and he sent the Holy Spirit for yeah. us. Now, this is the true transformation that we have access to because of what Jesus did. Um, Pastor Derek, I know you spoke just on, on Sunday. Um, I know you started verse 5 and you went, mm-hmm. I'm not sure where you all went. Where all did you go all the way through? You know, um, I went off on a detour. Yeah. You and I, hit and some I did, seven. And I, and I hit some seven. Yeah. <laughs> I touched 11 a little bit. I didn't make it to the destination uh, because, <laughs> you know, I think Pastor Jack will probably take us a little bit further. But, yeah. you know, I, I started talking about uh, on, on chapter five, I guess, verse five, rather, where it says those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about those things that please the spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But yeah. letting your spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sin nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. Read more, but that's that was kind of seemed like where I kind of parked my my right. car at right there. Yeah, <laughs> and I know on the front end, and and I, you said this at the beginning, but the whole establishing. Let's just make this clear: the flesh is messy. Yeah, that was just a nice way, like everybody, th- we're messed up. Mm. Ab- absolutely. And that's the position that the the law reveals to us. Right. It, re- it reveals that, man, the, the law is good, but the flesh is weak. Yeah. And uh, and that's been clear. And that's uh, that's something that we can read on the pages, but also we can experience in our life. And uh, Pastor Mike threw us a softball to pick up this Sunday underhand pitch. Right. Because it, he ended with we need help. Right. And uh, it reminded me, and I talked a little bit about it, and you did as well, uh, when Jesus was saying, I got I to go. 
Right. Uh, but I'm going to send you because the disciples had, I think they had some real questions like what's going to happen with us. Right. You know, you're no longer here to lead us. You're no longer here to teach us. You know, you would encourage us when we need encouragement mm-hmm. and so many more things. And so what's going to happen to us? And Jesus was telling them, I got to go because I need to send you the help that you need. Right. And that help, as we talked about, was the paraclete, which was yeah. the, the Holy Spirit. Which and great. when we right. speak about condemnation, that word, it does. It's like a legal type term. You pronounce guilty. But when you look at paraclete, you, it means an advocate, yeah. which means somebody who can stand in the gap for you, somebody who can comfort you and defend you in those type of moments. So I think, you know, setting the stage for the help that we needed um, was what really what I was trying to convey during Sunday's message. Part of it, at least. And I, I thought you did, seriously, a really great job uh, oh, yeah. with it, great. too. One thing that was um, always going to be an eye-opener for me is how you distinguish the law from the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, the law was more like a series of stop signs. Yeah. It could tell you, this is where you need to stop. This is where you need to stop. This is how you need to behave. Versus the Holy Spirit can get into the car and help you push the brake right. and, mm-hmm. you know, help you become who you need to become. Absolutely. And, and that's, and that's really what it was about. You know, I, you know, I call that type of work. It's really an inside job Yeah. in, um, I forget, I don't know if you sent me this pastor Jack, or I was just reading this somewhere, but it talked about this idea of externalism. I forget who, who it was, but this, uh, you know, there's the Pharisees suffered with this. They enjoyed looking good. Yeah. Looking know, the part, looking <laughs> the part. And it was an external, you know, having the form of godliness, Yeah. you know, let's, let's look deep, you know, let's, let's look holy. What the gospel is designed to do is bring about an internal transformation. When we receive the gospel from the inside out, you know, things change. Um, I always use this analogy, but I was thinking about this contractor that I worked with um, and uh, we were doing some development and uh, he was taking me through one of the rooms that he did. I had to do some quality control stuff. And he was like, and I was like, Hey man, this looks good. And I would, I would, I was just telling him how good it looks. And, uh, he wasn't giving me the enthusiasm that I was, I just complimented your work. And right. he was like, no, Derek, he said he was from Venezuela. He was like, it's more than look. He said, it is good. Uh, there you go. And <laughs> what he was saying is that, you know, it's not just that it looks good, but the whole thing is good. And yeah. I believe that's what the gospel does. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do to, he wants to do a good work on yes. the inside yeah. of us so that we just don't look good. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you've heard people say sometimes you had one job and usually yeah. they say that when, <laughs> yeah. when, when you mess, they mess up. up. Right. Yeah. But one of the things you said was the job of the Holy Spirit is to make us holy. Yeah, that was And really I just good. added in my notes, he had one job, mm-hmm. uh, and, and he's still doing that. And so when you talk Absolutely. about it doesn't just look good, it is good. That's the, the process, the result that he's bringing about in us. And it's not that we point that out because that's where he's failing us. It's actually because he's changing us and making us more like him. And so yeah. I, I loved when you told that story, and it really made me think about that, uh, that he has one job, and he's still doing that in us. And... And the whole part about transitioning into Acts 1, where you were talking about you will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, that that just was super helpful to me, even with what I go through in my own life. Paul, again, Paul makes this great statement where he, um, and Pastor Derek just read the passage uh, in the New International that says that the mind that is governed by the flesh is hostile to God it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And Paul has is writing this as a man who, if anyone could have done it, he would have done right. it. And so, the, but then he makes this great statement: "You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh; you're in the realm of the spirit." Yes. And uh, he had just, realm means what kingdom you're walking in. And just That's in the good. previous verse, he said, what is your mind governed by? Right. So again, there's that subjective power of the gospel. The objective power is that Jesus has done something for us. That's finished. Sin is condemned. Yep. But the subjective is then the Holy Spirit lives in us and not just lives in us, but he begins to exert control in yep. our lives. Right. Now, 
I love the uh, opening analogy. I think you quoted Charles Spurgeon's story about yeah, that's we, right. we both have uh, two dogs living inside of us. Right. And <clears throat> which one wins is the one that I feed. And um, so it, that's the great practical responsibility that we have. Um, walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Um um, we have to learn, and I, you talked about this, and I think Mike even in the first week talked about what's the strategy. Right, new how, strategy. That's right, new strategy. How, that's how, how that's good. do we begin to feed that spirit that's inside of us? But the spirit is there. Yeah. And um, and um, so how, if we if if we learn how to walk in the flesh, Paul says, or if we learn how to walk in the spirit, that's how we subdue the flesh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was uh, that was that Spurgeon story. So good. Oh yeah. And. Um, Man, so there was there's a part in your handout here too, freedom from the bondage to sin, and you're talking Romans eight nine through eleven. Uh, but the question you come up with, and I thought I'd bring this up to you guys: What does it mean practically to live by the Spirit in your everyday life? What kind of things would you guys point to to live practically uh, by the Spirit in your everyday life? I kind of talked about that at the end of mine, you know, um, where I, I was giving people uh, these. I just came up with five that I jotted down that if you are living uh, according to the spirit or walking according to the spirit, like verse four says versus the the flesh or the sinful nature. um, He's going to change some things about you. And that's where I talked about. He'll change you spiritually and physically and emotionally and financially and relationally. And you can keep going with other ones, but in every one of them, I pointed out a circumstance and then said, but if you're walking in the spirit, he's going to do this in that area. Right. And so I, I think it's just about, um, You know, I pointed out Galatians 5 where the spirit nature and the sinful nature are contrary to or in conflict with each other. And so um, which one is going to win the war in you is what it comes down to. And so when I'm walking in the spirit, I'm going to choose the things that are of God and that the Bible talks about and teaches me how to live. And so every day I've got to do that. And I, I, I actually prayed with someone at the altar this week after your sermon, Derek, about that some things that that he wanted to do. And so we talked about that specifically, that it's one day at a time. What am I going to do today on Tuesday to live in the spirit? Um, What am I going to do Tuesday morning and then versus Tuesday afternoon? Sometimes you have to break it down. So it came came down to me for that to think about that that sometimes it's just those little choices that I make on an ongoing basis throughout the day. Right. Um, I know something that you mentioned, and and I think it's really helpful, it was prayer. Like we, we need to be willing like to humble ourselves and pray is a serious, it's a serious on taking and it is humbling because you're, you're taking the decision making solely out of your own head, your own, your own realm. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're making it subject to, Mm -hmm. okay, what is the spirit actually saying? What is God saying in this situation? Uh, Absolutely. You know, that, that new strategy stuck with me when you said that, that Sunday and I, and I really thought about that, the strategy You know, and we talked about this last week, Um, you know, we believe, I believe, and I'm sure we all believe that God can do the miraculous now. Right. Yeah. He can do things suddenly. He can do things immediately. Mm -hmm. If he wanted to change a thing, he could. That's his business. You know, that's out of our pay, pay grade. There are some things that he does right away, but then there are some things that that require a strategy right. for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, we talk That's about those, those practical steps. Um, you know, it's sometimes prayer isn't the destination. You know, yeah. prayer prayer is where we receive our instructions from. Mm-hmm. You know, prayer is where we we hunt, we went to pray is to humble ourselves so that we can know because sometimes. You know, we could be praying for God to deliver us from a situation, right? whether it be drugs, alcohol, whatever that situation may be. But, and I say this, and I don't want to sound crazy, but you got to do more than pray. There are some steps that you need. There there are some things that you need to take because, you know, uh, (laughs) the book of James said, believe it, believe that there's one God. He said the devils do too. Right. You know, you, you're no different there. But it, but that the context of that was he was talking about faith without works. Yeah. Not meaning works to try to justify yourself. That's already done. You've already been justified by faith. But this type of work was that strategy. Okay, what am I going to do? If I'm struggling with alcoholism, 
I probably need to stay away from the bar or, right. the, or the people that ha- that I have that type of trauma bond with. And that's what we yeah. do together. Or if I'm struggling with pornography or whatever that situation is, that's a part of the strategy. And where prayer comes in is that, God, I need you to help me because he's yeah. a helper. Right. You know, but I found in most cases, he's not going to work against your own will mm. that for us, we collaborate with him, you know. We, we, we work in agreement with him. That's why he, the, the scripture tells us that we walk in the spirit or we, you know, in other words, we walk in lockstep with what he wants to do. Right. And I think too, we, I mean, we refer to him as the Holy Spirit, as the helper. He can only help you if you allow him to help you. Sure. And I think that prayer will do that. It, it, it realigns us back to, okay, who is in charge? Who am I seeking? Let right. your will, not my will, your kingdom come, not my kingdom. Right. Like it just changes the whole idea of, of, of I'm, I'm, I'm not after what I'm after. I'm after what you're after. Yeah. And if you start with that, see, you remember those, that popular saying, just pray. I hated that. And it's not, <laughs> obviously that's not good sound advice. It's maybe it's pray first. Yeah. Start mm-hmm. there. That's yeah. a good place to start. Yeah. And then pray again. Like, it's, it's Always pray. Like most slogans, it's reductionistic. <laughs> right. <laughs> I um, yeah. I look at this where Paul has both. There's a positive and a negative almost always in the way Paul teaches us. And the negative is through the Spirit put to death the misdeeds of the body. Mm-hmm. That's that's the one, one thing that he says. And that's one of the things we have to do strategically. We don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't. Mm-hmm. We... Um, the, the, the spirit of God is there to point out the stop signs yeah. and right. to, That's good. and when he points those out, we have to obey. We have to be pretty relentless with the things in us that need to be put to death. I, yeah. I, I shouldn't be drinking so much. I shouldn't be eating so much. I've got to stop thinking about people that way. Yeah. I can't even say that in my mind. I've got to stop doing that. Yeah. And, and right. those are ongoing things that we fight against. And that's the negative. But the positive is walk in the spirit. Right. right. And that means if we're going to walk, live in the spirit, that means we have to learn to listen to him and hear yes. his voice. Yeah. You know, Paul in, in the book of Ephesians says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And every time I talk about that, I want to say that's an interesting and purposeful juxtaposition. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So when someone is filled with wine, they say and do and behave in ways that they normally wouldn't because they're under the influence. That's great. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what Paul is saying is if you will get under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you will behave in a way you normally wouldn't behave when you're under the the uh, influence of the spirit. And That's good. How does that happen? Well, prayer's one of them. Yeah. Um, get into the Word of God so yes. that you become familiar with His voice. Yes. The, the Spirit of God speaks um, the words of God back to us. Um, disciplining your flesh. Um, getting yeah. up if you struggle with something, having a strategy for how to use your time so that you're not placing yourself in situations. Worship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When Paul says, be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, the very next lines are, sing to one another. Yep. Yeah. The songs and hymns and spiritual songs. So you've got to be in a worshiping community. You've yes, got to be yeah. in church. Yes. You've yeah. got to get together with other saints. So all of these are a part of practical strategies that we can put into our lives that will develop the, the um, ability that we have to walk in the spirit. I really appreciate you saying that. Cause I think there's a movement almost, or this idea that's kind of overtaken to an extent, the church where it's, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's true, but there's still religion involved. Sure. Like we have, and if we don't give ourselves the um, permission to rely sometimes on the strategy and the religion side of things, right. then really we're just we're just kind of floating out there in this yep. weird belief thing that doesn't really ever line up with anything and else. Every relationship has religion attached to it. Absolutely. You know, the book of James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and our Father is this, to look after the widow in their time of need. Absolutely. See, so, if I didn't religiously come home on a regular... Yes, absolutely. Yeah, just, my wife would be asking some questions. Exactly right. right. Yep. Yeah. There's a, there is a religion to every good relationship. So yeah. if you're in a marriage, you have have a religion. Absolutely. There are things that you do, there are expectations you have of one another. There's a pattern of living you engage yes. in that strengthens that relationship. And that's what the religion. So again, d- try live by scripture. Don't live by slogans. Exactly. He Man. called it righteous requirements. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
good. And and it was this thing that you, I think you preached this um, uh, quite a bit of Sundays ago, but you were saying you can't live off of devotionals. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's this, this idea. And I think what we really need, and I'm glad you, you brought that up is, you know, is it, you know, should we have a relationship with God? Of course we should. But oftentimes when you hear that, it's almost like, you know, that's just my, my slogan, so I can kind of live a little bit sloppy if I if right. I wanted yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. And what I think, you know, when we start talking about what you know, we start using words like revival and different things like that. You have to. Know, we well, here's what we have to understand: there still has to be a healthy fear and reverence, absolutely, for the Lord. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, again, I, we, and where you see that at, when you look at the Acts Acts of the Apostle, the Book of Acts. You know, you hear more about the Holy Spirit in operation, Mm -hmm. but they they moved a bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't want this to come back, but there was a time to where you you guys remember Ananias and Sapphira. Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. you know they 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 lied to the apostles. Yes, but the apostles said, "No, you lied to the Holy Spirit," Mm -hmm. and 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 you see what happened. So what I'm saying is now every Sunday's a funeral service. (laughs) We we would be. <laughs> it would be some slow singing and flower oh, bringing every single Sunday, but it just makes me think there has to be a a, a healthy reverence, yeah, yeah, um, a healthy reverence for for God and the things of God. That would be yeah. a different way to measure whether the Holy Spirit showed up at your church. How, how many people died? Yeah. died? How, yeah. how many corpses did you drag you out of the 16. sanctuary? <laughs> Well, it does make me think of, okay, so I have this neighbor, his, his name's Jimmy. And Jimmy, when you meet Jimmy, you're just scared because he has so many muscles. You don't know what to do. Like yeah. you're embarrassed of your life yeah. when you meet Jimmy. <laughs> but I, uh, I decided to go to the gym, um, this year. Okay. <laughs> Once yeah. and in January. One time. <laughs> <laughs> so again, and there's Jimmy. I was on, you know, like my third machine, whatever routine of whatever workout I was trying to figure out to do. I'm looking over at Jimmy. He obviously has a process that he's going through. Right. And I looked at Jimmy. I was like, I'm about to be as big as you, Jimmy. Once I get out of here, he started laughing. He's like, this is taking me a long time. But the thing is, is for, for Jimmy, something has died in him right. that he is now right. living in a totally different way. Yeah, and it's good. noticeable. Yeah. Right. Like you can see the growth in this mm. man. And for me, like I, I'm, I'm trying to die to something, but it's going to take me a while before I start looking like Jimmy. But he is consistently, religiously, faithfully coming back to the thing that's making him stronger. Yes. And it's not our normal. You're right. Like when you live under, in when you walk and you live with the Holy Spirit, it's calling you to things that you're not used to doing on your own. Mm-hmm. And it's going to grow you in ways that you can't do unless you stop doing what you were doing before. But I think the thing that it's a great analogy, you know, in another place, Paul tells the tells tells Timothy, exercise yourself unto Mm -hmm. godliness. And, um, you know, what I would say is, amazingly enough, you do have all the muscles that Jimmy has. Yeah, there you go. You just haven't developed them. Yeah, exactly. And it's so Paul says you you belong to Christ if indeed the spirit of Christ dwells in you. Yeah. And then he says, and if the spirit of Christ doesn't dwell in you, you don't belong there, to him. There it yeah. is. Now, what he's emphatically stating is, if you've been born again, the spirit is in you. Yes. Yeah. You said this, Pastor Derek, you have the Holy Spirit. So so you have every, all the potential. If you look across the room and you're you're looking at somebody that has all this spiritual muscle, you know, mm-hmm. they, they seem to really have it together. And maybe they do. They're godly and they're close to the Lord. You have the same spirit in you that they have in yes. them. Yeah, exactly. The question is, have you learned how to walk in that Absolutely. spirit? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, something else you said, uh, Derek, that was helpful for me was the spirit of God brings gifts. Yeah, he brings gifts along with him. His primary work is for to, be, to make us holy. And what you said was, so if you don't prophesy, be holy. Yeah. If you don't yes. do all these other things that people are doing, you can still be holy. Yes. And that's as, and that's just as powerful yes. as you operating in a spiritual gift because that's because many are going to say I prophesied in your yes. name. Yeah. Many are going to say I've done great exploits, but the ones that He's going to welcome into into uh, eternal rest are mm-hmm. those who have done what He said. Yeah, those who who have obeyed. And and you're right. You know that question is. Not does the holy, not do you have the Holy Spirit, but how much 
how much of yourself have you allowed have have you allowed him to have? Yeah. And that's the obstacle that the flesh it's all is there's I think it's Romans eight. He said, I find in another law mm-hmm. when oh, I yeah. desire to yes. do good, mm-hmm. evil is always there. Yeah. So there's 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 this agenda, there's this tactical assault on us as believers mm-hmm. becoming Christ like. Mm-hmm. And we have to be aware of that. So I, I know you two took on the first two weeks of this incredible chapter that we're trying to fit into four weeks of sermons. <laughs> we're jamming an awful lot. We're going to try, words. right? Um, it, what are some things that both of you would have liked to add to your message had you had the chance? Uh, Pastor Mike, what's something that you would have liked to say on uh, on the first Sunday if you had a chance? I think with everything we've been talking about, you know, walking holy, living with the Spirit, what what kind of changes does he bring about? And I wish I had had more time to expound on those five things, you know, the relationally and the spiritually. And, yeah. But that was really as I was bringing the sermon into a close. And and surprisingly, really, we had a, a good altar response, people coming yeah. forward to, to really pray about some things. So that was encouraging. But I wish I had had more time to talk about what those look like practically. Um, you know, what does it mean to trust God with your physical body more? Um any of those things. And, you know, maybe that'll come out when you guys kind of close this out in the next couple of weeks. But, but that's what I wish I'd had more time to talk about just because it helps people to go, Oh yeah, that is, that is what it would look like in my life. Right. If I trusted him with this area, um, and on started living with this according to the spirit instead. So that's where I would have expounded. You know, maybe I would have touched a little bit more on, uh, the freedom from fear. Mm. You know, that that whole freedom from fear, because when a person is gripped by fear, it impacts how they think, how they pray, Mm -hmm. how they see themselves and also how they see God. And I think, you know, um, you know, I think we Pastor Mike and I, we double team condemnation pretty good and try to give them a black eye. But, you know, the other side of that was also, you know, making sure people understood, man, like you don't have to be afraid you know, that work that, that Christ has done, you know, it freed the spirit's power, that, that power, uh, it gives you power not to walk in fear, you know, fear of your eternal security right? as a spirit, you know, as a believer. So maybe, you know, maybe I would have touched a little bit on that. And of course, you know, after the service, you think about everything you wish you would have said anyway. So (laughs) I got a long list of stuff, man. So, uh, Pastor Jack, how many weeks do you think it would actually take to to, to I, preach on chapter eight? I think you could fill a few months at least, <laughs> at least a few months, exactly. uh, because Paul, re- you know, I remember one of my favorite preachers that I read often when I was coming through college used to say that Paul is giving you headers in these in these letters that yeah. he writes, and in each verse contains really the seed of great doctrinal teaching so you could you could go verse by verse there's 30 some verses in this chapter 32 or 37 37 verses in this chapter 39 you could preach 39 weeks almost yeah Yeah. well we are going to do our best uh pastor jack and i are on the next few weeks (laughs) yeah and jack hasn't preached for the past uh, what three weeks so it'll be a month by the time i'm up there on sunday so god bless everyone that has to take it i'll I'll, I'll bring a pillow and (laughs) Blanky. Um, I'm, I'm only I'm only tackling the next seven or eight verses, and then I'm letting you finish up with the last thirteen verses or eighteen. Nice. Verses. No small task. <laughs> no small task, folks. Um, for the resources that we have for you guys, uh, Pastor Derek, you'd said, and this is a good one, really, yeah. is to just r- literally read chapter seven and chapter eight of yeah. Romans in yeah. the same yeah. sitting. Um, if you are listening and you are looking for the the best the best resource for the rest of this sermon series. Certainly go back and read seven and eight. And then Pastor Mike, you gave us a few resources as well. So yeah. you have called to be holy, a biblical perspective by yeah. John Oswald. Yeah. I referenced that a couple of times in this talking about the different journeys that we go on. And there was one other quote that I used from his about, uh, from that book about um, making Christ the King of your life, the exclusive ruler of your heart. And what kind of changes that brings about powerful book uh, was actually a textbook of mine when I was in Bible college studying through a, a course on Romans, and uh, I've never gotten over it. So it's a great book. Uh, the next one you have is The Kingdom Agenda, uh, What a Way to Live yeah. by Tony Evans. Tony Evans, you know, classic writer, been around a long time. I read that book 
25 years ago. Some of its uh, teachings are still staying with me. He talked in there about just the different things that happen um, when you give in to the, to the devil or to the flesh. So I thought that was appropriate there. Uh, then two more. This one is The Gospel Comes with a House Key by one of our new favorites, Rosaria yes. Butterfield. One of my favorite books I've ever ri- read. I started to say written. That's wrong. <laughs> that I've read. Um, just just powerful about when the gospel comes into your life, how does it change you? And we've talked about her before. She came out of a lesbian lifestyle. She's now um, married to a, a Presbyterian minister, a man. They have kids. They open their home up to people. Um, the gospel has changed her in so many ways, and she writes from that perspective and, and just challenges you to think about, well, what difference does Jesus and his gospel make in your life? Uh, the last one, I'll speak to this one, uh, blueletterbible.org. I love that resource. It's so good. If you're yeah. looking for an online resource uh, to, to get into the scripture, it breaks down, it gives you correlations, it gives you a, a bunch of uh, Hebrew and Greek uh, literature, the root words, commentaries. There are so many yeah. uh, big uh, pieces of that, good resources in there. Well, and one of the things that, that came up on Sunday even, I had a young man in our church who's newer here. He and his family just got baptized a couple months ago, and he was asking what translations we use yeah. when we yeah. teach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, he's like, well, I, I want to get that for my family, so I'm going to buy one for each of us, and we're going to start reading it together. Good. You talk about the gospel changing a family. Yeah, yeah that's You fantastic. start getting the Bible out and reading it together as a family. I can't wait to see what God does. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I thought that was a really uh, amazing thing to, just to think about. I didn't add that, but when you talked about Blue Letter Bible, you've got access to those. Yeah. There. You can choose what translation to use. So it was really neat to think about that. All right, this has been episode 21. Thank you guys for a good conversation. Uh, This has been week one and two of our new series, Romans 8, The Power of the Gospel. Uh, We will pick this back up next week. And uh, if you have any questions, always feel free to email me, nick at highpointlw.com. And we will see you all next week. Thanks for being with us. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Cutting Room Floor. If you have questions about High Point Church or want to find out more, Go to highpointlw.com.